The goal of my talk today is to address the discovery and first description of Ebola virus. The discovery of the virus and the description of the epidemic clinically and epidemiologically. And again, to share this, this uh, comment I made a minute ago, that past is really prologue. We've seen so many outbreaks of hemorrhagic fever uh, occurring since that time, and we have to learn from the past. And maybe most importantly at a school of public health that, and science, that leadership and partnerships are the key to getting anything done successfully uh, despite the chaos that reigns during these uh, types of horrific outbreaks. The story begins in 1967 when a cluster of Cercopithecus aethiops, African green monkeys, arrived in Hamburg and uh, Belgrade, and uh, 31 laboratory technicians got sick and seven died, and there was sec uh, secondary transmission. And a brand new virus called Marburg, because it was Marburg, uh, Germany, where um, the cases started occurring. And so this RNA virus was identified, uh, patients died, um, and then it was forgotten, basically. A little bit of research in Germany, but nothing else occurred. So it was called African green monkey disease, despite the fact that when I went through the literature, I found that these monkeys had contact with 33 other animals along the way in transit and at the laboratory. So here, in now fast forward to 1976, early October, I get a call. I'm now actually a state epidemiologist, along with all this that you had heard. Uh, the director of CDC asked me to, if I wanted to stay there, I needed a domestic post for a while. So I'm in the state of Michigan, and I get a call saying there's a hemorrhagic fever outbreak uh, the embassy in Kinshasa, uh, Zaire had called and said, can you send someone over? Uh, so I said, well, why'd you call me? You've asked me to come back uh, and serve. He said, well, you speak French, you've lived in Africa previously. Um, you know, nobody else volunteered. <laughs> so make a long story short, after back and forth and getting clearances and talking to people to find out what was going on, just uh, three things I was told, that 100% of the villages were affected, 100% of the people in the villages were sick, and all those people had died. Well, I had known of no disease. I still don't. Maybe rabies at that time had one survivor. But I said, I didn't know. Uh, of anything. So, you know, talked her over with my <coughs> loving wife and two kids. Haven't been divorced <laughs> yet. Uh, and uh, the chief of the laboratory, Carl Johnson, and I were ready to get on an airplane, except we got another call now from the World Health Organization saying that a similar epidemic was, a, oops, was occurring in uh, South Sudan uh, on the border uh, of DR Congo, here in Maridi and in Zara. And there was civil war going on then as now, and it was almost impossible to get people in. And um, so they basically said, we're gonna try and get a team into Sudan as well. But we want you to go to Zaire. The day before, uh, uh, a few days before we left, uh, specimens were taken from patients in DR Congo uh, and sent to Antwerp. Recall that there was a hundred year history of the Belgians colonizing this area. And specimens went to Antwerp. And from Antwerp, they were sent to Porton Down, England, which had a maximum containment laboratory and then onto the CDC, which did have a well-known maximum containment laboratory there, but they didn't in Antwerp. But nevertheless, 
all three laboratories saw a similar virus that had occurred in uh, 1967, and so the, they thought it was Marburg. They had seen it under the electron microscope and cultured it. So let me comment on what these events had occurred. The first patient had presented to this uh, isolated rural hospital in northern Zaire with fever, chills, headache. They thought it was malaria. Gave an injection, remember that, an injection of chloroquine for malaria. The fever went down a little, but a week later, a rip-roaring syndrome of hemorrhagic fever began. And this, the headmaster of the school in this community, famous guy, then died of hemorrhagic fever. And over the next two weeks, another 17 cases occurred, most of whom had died and then Kinshasa was notified. The local doctor was very honest in saying he didn't know what it was. So uh, Professor Moyembe, who was then a younger microbiologist and another, uh, at that time, Zairean doctor came up and they said, this may be typhoid or yellow fever. And they also gave some immunizations for typhoid and they evacuated uh, a Belgian nun who was a nurse there who was sick, and she came with another nun down to uh, Kinshasa. And in uh, 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 next, because the epidemic kept going on till the end of the month, they closed the hospital, the remaining nuns. This hospital, 120 bed hospital run by uh, the, the Belgian uh, expatriate uh, team. It was next visited by a Belgian doctor and a French doctor who uh, collected those specimens that I, I mentioned in early October, and that's about when we got uh, the call, and uh, these specimens then came to the U.S., and then the second Belgian nursing sister was ill in Kinshasa, and then a Zairean nurse got ill, and uh, the virus was isolated and thought to be a Marburg. Then, just before we left, on uh, about the 15th uh, for Kinshasa, a new agent identified at the CDC uh, was, uh, was identified, and then we, we got on the airplane the same day that they identified, and I'll show you that. A clinician from South Africa who had dealt with a two-person outbreak in 75 of Marburg came to Kinshasa with Marburg convalescent plasma, which was given to this patient uh, and uh, the nurse, the, the uh, Zairean nurse, and she died. So then on the 18th, the day we arrived, our international commission was formed. That's the key. Now, how was it that uh, we identified a new virus at the CDC? Uh, this um, specimen, there was also a serum specimen that came and the virus specimen. And the viral antigen at the CDC, we had Marburg, we have Marburg, and the Zairean specimen. And they had some specimens of serum from Marburg uh, in uh, 67 and South Africa in 75. And uh, later on, they got Sudan uh, specimens. But here, the serum did not, from uh, Zaire 76, did not react at all with Marburg 67, but had a very high titer to uh, Zaire 76. So this is now a new, new virus. And that is where the discovery and identification of the virus had occurred. And because there is a conflict often in science on who discovered things, HIV, recall, very controversial, and here there's actually a discussion on who discovered Ebola, I'm going to tell you that the CDC identified for the first time Ebola virus the other laboratories and the CDC recovered Ebola virus. Does that make sense? 
okay? So we arrived, Dr. Johnson and I arrived, never having been, either of us, in this country. And around the table are folks from Belgium, uh, DR Congo, of course, and our leader was a, a minister of health. Uh, later on, Canada brought some uh, isolation uh, equipment. France, South Africa, the US, and the World Health Organization. And we're sitting around the table early in the morning, having just gotten off the airplane from Geneva, when the minister says, we are so glad that the team is here and assembled, uh, and we're, the airplane is ready to send people up to the epidemic area. Well, Carl, who didn't speak a word of French, uh, says, you know, these people, and I'm translating, so it seemed to be well organized. I said, Carl, this is incredible. We have all this information, and uh, there's an epidemic now of chains of transmission in Kinshasa. We could find out what's going on. And everyone's looking at us. Uh, we had brought 17 cartons of scientific equipment, and um, they were putting us on an airplane and asking us to leave all of our equipment back in Kinshasa. And we said, you know, no, we don't know what's going on. And, but they said, someone has to go. The president is demanding action. And so I got on the airplane with uh, two Belgians, a Frenchman, and a uh, Congolese, and went the day after arrival up north. So here we are uh, in Kinshasa, and here is uh, Yambuku, the epidemic area, about uh, 1,200 kilometers. Here is the complex of effluents uh, in the uh, Congo River. This is what you see. And then as you, uh, we had as our goal, we were talking to each other Quickly, this epidemic is uh, really causing uh, havoc uh, to delimit the epidemic, to see if there's active disease, to see if there are convalescents, so that we could um, begin a plasmapheresis program and uh, treat people, if need be, in the future, and to determine local needs to move the entire operation up north to this 120-bed hospital. We had no idea how many people were sick or how fast it was spreading at all. So things are moving pretty fast. And you can see the type of roads. Dr. Ramoyne, I'm sure in her presentations, have showed you the environment. That's pretty typical. This car, if it's not stuck in the mud now, will soon be. And this is, <laughs> this is a very barren uh, church. Uh, in the uh, famed community of Yambuku, where the uh, sisters and fathers had been since uh, the mid-1930s, and they were very popular in regard to health, education, uh, edu um, agriculture, and a number of disciplines. So they were respected and loved by the Yambuku community. However, when we arrived, uh, on the road, the S Sister Marcella, the Sister Superior, had showed us, this is now the hospital, they didn't know what had occurred. They brought out all the mattresses from the patients who had died or not and sprayed them with disinfectant or DDT, whatever they had. And ultimately, five of the uh, religious community had died. And they had uh, pictures of, uh, of that here. So the first day we were there, we get in the Land Rovers and we divided north, south, east, west with the team that had arrived to delimit. And within a half hour outside, and we were asking, we had a, a preliminary uh, protocol uh, because we were just doing a preliminary study, quick and dirty, uh, to find out uh, uh, and respond to our four goals. And we asked people if there were anyone here with l'epidemie, le la maladie. So this gentleman was in a hut in a dark corner, and they brought him out to the courtyard. And we used the personal protection equipment of the day, which is paper gowns and gloves and the rest of it. And this man was complaining of severe headache, leaning forward uh, with, uh, you can't see, uh, patches in his palate. He had a conjunctivitis and he had oozing of blood 
around the lips. But the most severe thing was the uh, pain and he, that he had had for about four or five days, and the bleeding had just begun the day before. So we just had, what do we have with us as medicines? Just the antibiotics and antipyretics and uh, anti-malarials, and that's all we could do, and talk to the people about keeping him isolated. And they said, we know about that because we had dealt with smallpox eradication previously. Um, that was very important for isolation and burial. So the plane didn't arrive for a week or so after it would have, and we were trying to communicate. But finally, we brought the whole team up into uh, Yambuku. And here is a C-130 from the Zairean Air Force, and just a shot of how you work out there. We got from the uh, Mamiyemu Hospital, directed by Dr. Bill Close, uh, who had been with President Mobutu for 16 years, and ran the hospital, largest hospital in Africa at that time. Uh, we had met him on the airplane coming down. The equipment that we needed was sent up for us to set up our investigations. And ultimately, we had uh, six teams going around 10 circuits, because we still didn't know how far out the epidemic went. And now here's the Central African Republic, and this is about uh, 200 kilometers from the Zaire River, the uh, Bumba, here's Yambuku and Yandongi in this area, big cities, big uh, villages. And so our teams, and it was tough to get people to work, started going along these circuits um, several times. There were approximately 550 hamlets, or small villages, that were visited several times to find patients or suspect patients. And of course, we, there were so many rumors coming in now from all over the country, but particularly from the Equateur uh, region that uh, we finally got some helicopters uh, that helped us move around. Now, what was it that we'd done, that we did? Uh, here is uh, an immunologist, uh, Dr. Mbui, and uh, Nurse Sukato, who had uh, Ebola uh, and recovered, even before we arrived, doing an interview in a village. And this gentleman uh, is uh, grieving and as a sign of mourning, he shaved his head. That helped us identify uh, families, because we, then we were doing more in-depth interviews. And fast forward, uh, we found 318 people who had had the syndrome, and we had to find uh, confirmed cases, uh, probable cases, and suspect cases, and classified them. And we had also brought up with us in this equipment immunofluorescent antibody uh, equipment and testing and antigens on slides. And that was one of the main things that CDC was sending out now, uh, slides uh, with uh, antigen from the new virus on it. And we were collecting, we collected over a thousand sera from that area so we could identify. Now we also sent a team to Northeast uh, Zaire to comb the border with Sudan to see if there was uh, a connection. And ultimately, we found out that Sudan had uh, uh, close to 300 patients, but the case fatality rate was only about 50%. And the syndrome, as later we found out, was quite different, a lot of respiratory signs. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. And now I'll talk about what we found clinically. So in regard to symptoms, uh, most, of course, uh, almost all of these histories were from family members, but with a, uh, a chart of historic events. And we trained, translated into Lingala and Budza, the questionnaires. And you could see of those who died, uh, universally they had fever, headache, abdominal pain, sore throat, uh, muscle pain, nausea, and uh, a fair number had arthritis. 
and the syndrome was milder in those few patients who had recovered. The signs, diarrhea, then as now, was very, very prominent. Bleeding was prominent, but oozing, as I described for that patient, was much more prominent than frank hemorrhagic uh, uh, extirpation and extravasation as defined in that science fiction novel, uh, The Hot Zone. So here we have, <laughs> And then oral lesions, I showed you the vomiting, conjunctivitis, very prominent in these patients. So that's the clinical syndrome. Now epidemiologically, of the 300 uh, patients, we had uh, newborns, a pregnant woman, pregnant women were at great peril, um, and their babies, all of them died. Uh, the pregnant woman, many of them, uh, had bleeding that was uncontrolled. Uh, and so the 8% uh, the, uh, are in those young babies. But here we have 19% uh, of all the patients were in the woman 15 to 29. Women there, as everywhere, are take care of sick people. And so there was a, a predominance of women in these 318 patients. Now I mentioned the injection that Mabalo got early on, uh, the first patient, uh, and then his uh, fever abated for a while and then came back with the hemorrhagic syndrome. As we talked to the sisters and the staff, they were telling us that for this 120 bed hospital, they had five syringes and needles for the outpatient and the inpatient internal medicine which they washed in a little soap and water, and they were using the same needle and syringe. So we, I mean, in medicine, you have very few times when you're just shuddering when you hear this, and then epidemiologically, you start looking more carefully to put this together. You see early on, the patients had received an injection uh, and then went back to their villages and had person-to-person -person contact. So this is the epidemic curve early on, and at the end, 30, when the, when the remaining staff saw what was going on, they closed the hospital. The patients ran away. They knew the hospital was the source of the epidemic, and here back in the villages, those who ran, they were infecting others in the village. So the epidemic was over in early November. Recall that we had arrived here, but we didn't know the epidemic was over. As an epidemiologist, you love it when the epidemic is over, but you, know, but you don't know it. You're sitting in the middle of, uh, of uh, chaos. Now here's the incubation period that we found. For those who received injection, it was a nice curve Again, putting this historically with a mean of about, and a median of about six or seven days. And of those who had person-to-person -person contact, uh, the time had gone to 21. And this includes the first contact that the patient had with uh, another patient. So the infection may have occurred later so that the incubation period of 9.5 may have been much shorter. We don't know when infection occurred. So now if you're wondering where the 21 days comes from for having a patient uh, free, declared free of the disease, it's still used from the very first outbreak. And 42 days is for an area which is twice the known incubation period where a quarantine or isolation is levied. So this is what we found at that time. Now, a, a, a few of the factors associated with uh, contact uh, and infection are shown here with the controls of the family and the control few in the village, uh, touching a case, everyone was touching a case or cared for a case or sleeping in the room or preparing a cadaver or attending in the funeral. But if you were a traditional midwife or even a trained midwife, as occurred with the Belgian nuns, you had a higher risk 
of coming down with this disease. Food, animals, uh, other environmental factors did not play a role we looked into. Now we had heard, as I told you, that all the villages were uh, affected, but that wasn't the case. That a third of them had only one patient and uh, two thirds of the villages had two, two to five cases and um, then just less than 10, almost 90% had uh, nine or fewer cases and only two uh, villages had more than 30 patients. So it wasn't such a firestorm as we have been led to believe with the disease spreading so rapidly. Now here is probably the most important epidemiologic slide uh, and that is the secondary attack rates. Um, from those, again, this is gathering data and confirming it and going back and talking to the people, again, retrospectively. But if you had had an injection in your families, there are about 500 uh, uh, exposures, only less than 8% of the family members were infected. And recall, just about everyone had some contact. But then as the epidemic in the next generation, uh, uh, the uh, attack rate started decreasing and then decreasing after that in the fourth generation and then there was only one in the fifth generation. So the secondary attack rates were very, very low and that's why we say Ebola, at least in that epidemic, is not a highly transmissible, it's highly fatal. Now, if you were delivering the fetus or a caregiving spouse, and I, I think we know that in the current epidemic, there's a lot of healthcare workers who are taking care of folks at home and in the community, but now you have a higher secondary attack rate. So, as I say, we brought all the equipment up and we could collect those serum specimens and do the immunofluorescent antibody test right that day and have a result, uh, particularly um, for finding those who had recovered and identifying them as convalescents. And here's Dr. Vandergroen uh, with his uh, glove box and there's a little fan in the corner so there was negative pressure with him. So this is good uh, tension. He uh, was in a toilet actually doing uh, his IFA testing uh, with the uh, microscope. So now here is practice of the time. This is the 1970s before HIV AIDS and of course we knew about hepatitis and other things. But these are recovered patients. Uh, here is a uh, whoops, Peace Corps volunteer collecting some specimens from a family member and here's a convalescent who uh, was being treated by our clinician here was taking plasma. We're doing plasmapheresis. So here's a part of the team here. This is, you know, don't do this at home <laughs> for a number of reasons. Uh, we did some virology. Only one patient in Kinshasa could we do serial virology. That, in none, basically, of the 20 plus epidemics till recently have we done virology? And here you see the nurse, the Zairean nurse, uh, her uh, titer uh, between four and six logs of uh, Ebola virus maintained. She was given Marburg plasma, as I mentioned, and she had no antibodies at all there to anything. So what did we learn? Uh, how are we doing in time here? Moving forward, uh, the first outbreak, we defined the manifestations, the incubation period. We started plasmapheresis, the geographic extent, persons at risk, the mode of transmission, quarantine worked, uh, identify and isolate patients, rapid burial. We emphasized uh, building on their smallpox knowledge. We provided them with bleach and formaldehyde to decontaminate them and the local folks that we were working, you know, when I say we, we're talking about the village health authorities as well as the uh, Congolese infrastructure. And then we ruled out other diseases. All of our surveillance teams traveled with the 
antimicrobials and antipyretics that I mentioned. Anyone had a fever and chills, they gave all of it to them and then came back a few days later uh, to see if the fever had abated because malaria far and away was the most important problem. The basic laboratory tests, we could only do immunofluorescent. We did a few coagulation tests and IFA for Ebola and only one patient for virus. Now things were so chaotic and our focus for the Ministry of Health was number one, two, and three, control this epidemic. Uh, research, fine. Uh, ecology, the source, uh, interest, but no um, resources that they had at that time. But we did have a mammologist from France who uh, collected bed bugs and uh, a few mosquitoes and uh, a few rats, and we found absolutely nothing. So what were the major unknowns? Animal reservoir, how humans became infected, treatments, vaccines, or the extent globally. Sound familiar? Yeah. Same thing today. Anyway, we made our recommendations, look into all these things. Ebola, over there, World Health Organization, other priorities. Here's what we recommend you do. Set up teams for you know, rapid investigation and control. All forgotten and done. Epidemic's over, did a good job. Here's the order of the leopard. You know. <laughs> and publicity, those were the days. My wife sitting here in the front row got no calls, no communication at all from me. And this is what she saw if she had a chance to read. She was full time in school at, th at that time. So the virus responsible for the epidemic of green monkey fever claims several hundred lives will be known as Ebola virus after River in the North, a statement that no direct link had been established between the virus in Yambuku and the Marburg strain in South Sudan. So they got it wrong a couple of, in a couple of ways. This is tucked in the back pages of the Times. No interest at all. In the next year, the three laboratories published their uh, data in the Lancet. And you can see the Antwerp group here, uh, isolation of Marburg, Marburg from hemorrhagic fever, viral hemorrhagic fever in South Sudan. And then the CDC, isolation and characterization of a new virus causing acute hemorrhagic fever in Zaire. So what are the lessons? Quickly go through these. I mentioned leadership. Uh, Johnson and I had never been uh, in that uh, country for that, at that time. Uh, he was named as scientific director and I was named as chief of control epidemiology and surveillance. Why was that? Well, he had worked in Panama and named several uh, viruses, was renowned as a virologist and respected. And why was I named? I worked many years on smallpox eradication. But anyway, I mentioned to you that Bill Close had been on the airplane and uh, he was wired right into the, the ministry and others. But uh, we did have leaders for everything. Organization, the communications, the Belgian, Dr. Rupol, uh, transparency key, everything we knew was shared. Partnerships I mentioned, coordination. Again, the Belgians did a fantastic job. And Dr. Close, a uh, Columbia Harvard trained surgeon, took on the responsibility of administration and supplies with uh, great relish, and thanks to him was important. Transport, essential. And you saw how we got the vehicles and the airplanes mobilized. Quarantine was done, isolation. And then those who had recovered, we helped with uh, certain benefits. And then they, in turn, gave food and others to those who were sick, and they participated in plasmapheresis. Now, on the scientific side, we worked hard in polishing and constantly updating case definitions. 
Uh, we had standardized data collection. You know, we didn't have computers in those days, but our forms were computerized for when we took them back and then um, uh, analyzed the data as you saw. Local care for patients, while we didn't see many patients, we were prepared uh, for referral. Uh, the medical care, this was probably the most crucial item to get the trust of the community. We brought up uh, Zairean, uh, both general practitioners and surgeons, because what was going on? Malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, obstructive labor, auto accidents, and the rest. Uh, farming accidents, and then slowly and surely patients started coming back. Uh, we used the trained medical and nursing volunteers, we trained them, and then these repeat village searches, uh, 55 villages were infected of 550 that we visited. The 55 we visited twice every three weeks, and uh, uh, three times, and the others we visited uh, uh, twice to confirm there were no patients. The serial surveys they talked about, laboratory, personal protection. And then later on, in later years, uh, we mounted some uh, in-depth ecologic studies. And we collected uh, hundreds of animals uh, and uh, never found anything virologically or serologically. So how do you get teams to actually work in the field? Big challenge un under these circumstances. A lot of fear, a lot of uh, fling, both from northern, uh, eastern, western, and southern uh, scientists. They didn't want to go out there because of the danger. We understand that. So we said that each person, and I was responsible for this, take your temperature twice a day. And if anyone gets sick, you report it to your team leader if you're doing surveillance, or to me, or uh, others who were monitoring this. Then this may have been the most important. We said every, anyone who gets sick of any nationality will be treated the same. Of course, we didn't know what that would be in regard to evacuation. We were still working on the evacuation plan uh, here. Um, and then the next thing, we said there will be no individual publications on the field work that initially we will all publish under one. And we did that uh, as the International Commission in the Bulletin of the World Health Organization in 1978. So nobody was scampering around for preeminence. Uh, selective compensation, we had uh, a budget. Uh, Dr. Rupol was walking around with a, basically a suitcase of Zaire's, which uh, had, had no <laughs> value outside of where we were. And then recognition. We urged the uh, Commissaire de la Sante to give uh, uh, certificates and benefits to those who worked. But this is very important. Equal treatment uh, and group publication really helped. And someone did get sick on my birthday, saddest day perhaps of my life, uh, professionally. And this is the fellow who was taking the blood sample I showed you before. And this is a uh, transport isolator. He had fever, he had even rash, chills, and didn't respond, and we said what to do. So we had arranged a plan to evacuate this young man to South Africa. To had experience with Marburg. He, they never, he did not have Ebola. And uh, we still to this day don't know what he had. They did a number of arboviral and uh, bacterial evaluations. And there are a lot of things out there in the jungle that cause fever and chills. And so we don't know, but he didn't have Ebola, mercifully. So here's Dr. Johnson. Uh, looking at the area in Northeast Zaire, tracing the, uh, the path that uh, Joe McCormick, Simon Van Nievenhove, and others took across this rough border. They never found a connection. But two weeks before the Sudan team could even get there, McCormick, of course, with his uh, gusto, went into and did a mini investigation here in the Sudan, left them a note, been here. <laughs> the, uh, 
The Ebola River is outside of the epidemic zone. And Johnson, who had a lot of experience, uh, said, we don't want to stigmatize Yambuku, as has occurred in the past. So, as it turned out, let's stigmatize Ebola. But <laughs> anyway, that is a small little river. We had a picnic up there one day. It's not a, a big flowing stream. So let me talk a little for the social scientists here. Uh, we're all in this business, social scientists. Let me, if you look up here, here's anxiety of everyone, and I'm not excluding the medical folks. And here's information sharing going from low to high. This is high to low. You start, and we saw the terror, the fear, the confusion, the presidents and his family up to Europe with two of the four airplanes that were functioning in the country. Chaos. Now these local investigations I mentioned, some specimens were collected. And then the uncertainty and anger from all the deaths, sorrow, shock. So isolation, they start doing some things. Then the commission was formed, the virus was isolated. And the electron micrograph, I carried around pictures. Johnson just grabbed a couple of those and I showed them to the village chief and others who said, ah, it's not a spirit or our bad behavior, but it's a microbe. So we could do that. So this then moved into focus and trust, and then we were now doing surveillance and our investigations and the burial all was going. Confidence, comfort, the camaraderie among the team. We were still worried because we didn't know if it was over, but we were managing those whom we could manage and doing some other things. And our investigations were well underway. And then at the end, we had some clarity as to what was going on. And we were really rolling in terms of case detection. We had our plasmapheresis program, which as I mentioned, continued into the end of January. We collected over 200 units. Uh, and then the quarantine was lifted. So here the champagne was opened, uh, as was the Jack Daniels. <laughs> Now here is uh, Team Ebola, it's uh, very important. Uh, here's a start with Dr. Miatudila, who uh, was uh, one of the clinicians who came up. He was working with us and took care of hundreds of patients and really opened the hospital and gained the confidence. And then Sister Marcella, whom you've seen, Sister Antoinette and Sister Geno is taking the picture. And then others from uh, France, and Belgium and uh, the, the U.S. So let's, uh, so we thought again, a meeting was held in uh, 77. Uh, a book was published uh, out of Antwerp. Uh, and then Bill Close uh, himself wrote a book in 1991. 90, by the way, this is the very best. How many have read this book, by the way? Well, if you want to read the very best book, on uh, Ebola, this is it. Um, and we thought it was all over. And then Kikwit 95 occurred. Now Lori Garrett, the, uh, at that time, the Newsday uh, reporter brought her satellite phone and jumped on the airplane and came out. And this now was a different time. Kikwit had 315 cases, this is also in Congo. And the health staff, huge outbreak in the health staff and in caregiving spouses all over the world now. Publicity, uh, Richard Preston talked now about an outbreak uh, in the laboratories that it occurred in 89, a different strain, Reston strain of Ebola. So his book was now out uh, the film Outbreak was uh, publicized and uh, science fiction was now attached with uh, Ebola at that time. And at our meeting in 76, we had renewal of uh, it was a scientific meeting in Antwerp. And here are a few of the people, so many of you know uh, Peter Piat. And here is Dr. Moyembe, who I'm sure has visited or will be visiting UCLA many times. And then Joe McCormick, who covered the border. David Heyman, 
who has achieved prominence in developing global surveillance for many disease. And here is Patricia Webb, who actually did the virology and serology on the original outbreak in the CDC laboratory. So at that meeting, I took the data that we had. Uh, I organized a meeting with Guido Vandergren in Antwerp. And at the meeting, I showed this slide. I updated it from 96 meeting to 2000 because a few other outbreaks had occurred. Um, and we had the Thai forest outbreak in Cote d'Ivoire, right on the Liberia border. We had South Sudan, then we had now a number of Marburg outbreaks in the east. And now a number of small outbreaks of Ebola had occurred here. And this recall is the 75 Marburg. So I just, recalling the meningitis belt across Africa, called it the phylovirus triangle, even though these countries weren't filled in. I guess I was prescient because little did we know that outbreaks, that this outbreak would occur here. And we did, we showed some virology from the various outbreaks. There had been some great ape outbreaks and human outbreaks in Gabon. And here we have the uh, strains of Zaire, the Thai forest, Cote d'Ivoire, Sudan, the Reston, then Marburg, a different, totally different uh, genetic profile here. So we're now beginning to understand the difference in virology. And these are the five uh, uh, phyloviruses that we now know. Uh, this is the mainly northeast uh, Zaire, uh, Uganda, Zaire, and the case fatality rates, the Reston, which curiously infects only animals, and a few humans, there might be antibodies, but no disease in humans. In the Sudan, a different strain, the case fatality rate and repeated outbreaks have been 50%, and that Thai forest. And here's the Ebola virus, uh, the green one attacking a viral cell and causing uh, havoc. So here, there have been 24 outbreaks since that time. And the recent one, of course, is, is a tsunami compared to all the others. Now I think we're close to 27,000 cases with over 11,000 deaths occurring in three areas of West Africa, up here, beginning in the forest, or think, the thought is beginning in the forest of Guinea, a country which, as Annie mentioned, I lived for two years in days of yore. So I, I do know, and recently was in Cote d'Ivoire, um, which hasn't been affected, but Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and then multiple other outbreaks of these 24 have occurred. Um, in regard to where this virus is sitting, the natural reservoir. Uh, one hypothesis is that bats carry it, but we're still not sure if the bats that carry it uh, are those that are directly responsible for contaminating humans. The histories uh, and the findings from the ecologic studies do not bear this out, although antibodies and even some virus is claimed to have been found in a duker. And of course, there have been major outbreaks in the great apes in Africa. So this is still open. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time other than in some caves in Africa, 5% of the bats do have evidence of having some uh, phylovirus antibodies. So in this recent outbreak, this is, what are my uh, reflections on what's going on. Well, at, now at the highest level, we, around the world, we have had interest and commitment. And I think we should all be proud of our commitment that, of course, with so many patients, and these three countries in particular, brought to their knees in every way. Uh, the president sent in the troops to build some clinical uh, facilities because you know, as medical people, uh, you know, take care of the sick people first. Regrettably, the, the wave 
was so high and deep of patients that tracing contacts, isolation, and management of the, uh, of the epidemic control could not occur for months and months. And there were a, a lot of problems with leadership uh, and resources along the way. But wh when we stepped in, really, even in all countries, it was helpful. What have we learned in regard to the science? Because that's what we were all waiting for. Tell us more about the patients. We were, didn't have much information. And now, in very few patients at the CDC, Emory, uh, Nebraska, the three places they took care of patients, we found that the immune cells are those that are ravaged, the macrophages, the dendritic cells, and then uh, the impact on the uh, blood vessels cause this diarrhea and uh, third spacing leakage so that the patients are hugely dehydrated and that rehydration with large volumes of, uh, of fluid has been the key to saving patients. We didn't know that before this outbreak, how important that was. And then there was a cytokine storm. And because of the huge uh, leakage, there was uh, metabolic instability, uh, and uh, they were probably dying from arrhythmias due to potassium depletion. That was found out. I'm not going to comment too much on the therapeutics, but to my interpretation at a recent filovirus meeting, a combination of monoclonal antibodies really looks very, very good. And then there are a number of antivirals, some of which may be familiar, and they don't seem to be working so well. At NIH, where I am now and uh, know well, Dr. Sullivan and her team who have been working on a vaccine for decades, this looks good. And she has been waiting for support for over 10 years to get out and do some studies. And she's doing them now, finally, with a lot of support. And uh, so when all this hit, uh, people were asking me two questions. One, who discovered Ebola virus? We've been hearing that Ebola virus was discovered somewhere else by some other people. <laughs> and then what should we be doing? So that was the basis upon which uh, Dr. Johnson and I wrote a, uh, an article that got a lot of buzz because we said, hey, we need information on what's going on. You know, I didn't, we didn't address the question of who discovered it, but that's, we just talked about what we did briefly, some of which was in the forgotten literature. And then I'm going to end with now the president coming to NIH and talking to Nancy and assuring support for her project. Now, the epidemic we think is waning. I will tell you, I talked to the father of a young doctor who is now on the Guinea Sierra Leone border. And he told me that there are still, well, we know patients are still percolating along that order, and many families are still running into the forest. So while Liberia is free, Sierra Leone looks good, Guinea, dear to my heart, I had my honeymoon there and still love the people and the place, uh, is a problem. Because these areas are so difficult and the epidemic has waned, it's going to be tough to do the studies with these biologics that I mentioned. But they are ongoing, and we should get more information. Let's hope that what happened in the past 24 outbreaks, that it's forgotten because it hasn't affected us so greatly. Recall, no American has died of Ebola. No American has died of Ebola. One person came, non-American, who died here. So let's hope that the interest maintains. Thank you very much. So I don't know if there's anybody coming into this classroom after this, but does, I, I think we probably have time for a few questions, if there are any. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to uh, ask while we have 
Dr. Bowman standing in front of us. Sure. Question. Any thoughts as to why in the current outbreak there was no spread between the two guineas? Between the two guineas? You're talking about Guinea-Bissau? Right. Um, well, that's a great question. Or into Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, there is a contact. It's a very, very uh, rough area. I know that area up there. And there are some of the Pul people who move back and forth. Uh, recall that one Guinean patient went from uh, southeast Guinea up to Senegal and didn't spread the disease. He must have gone through Gambia and possibly even Guinea-Bissau to get there. So I can't explain why. Uh, the health services there are absolutely abominable in Guinea-Bissau. So nobody's going to go to get care. Uh, from Guinea or anywhere else in Guinea-Bissau, but they do have family contacts. And the four car, the uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone, uh, more even than Guinea-Liberia or the other two, uh, Guinea and Sierra Leone are very tight ethnically. So, other questions? Yes. Cheryl. Are there, is there any work that's being done on like um, studying platelet aggregation as far as like the hemorrhagic? There, there, is, there is some work, uh, particularly with the models that have been going on. And the, the hemorrhage, uh, I can't speak to all the details of the hemorrhagic diathesis other than the uh, blood uh, cell leakage, uh, leakage that we talked about. Um, you know, disseminated intravascular coagulation uh, is occurring, but don't, can't speak to that. Annie? I have a question. So if, if someone were to give you uh, money to do a study, to say you, Joel Brennan, what study do you think is the most important thing that isn't being done that you yourself, if you had the time and the money and the ability to just go back to anywhere in this area, not just West Africa, also including DRC, what study would you do? Okay, well, I'm going to answer that with a couple of things. At the recent filovirus meeting, the most interesting title of any paper was called I Told You So. <laughs> this was by an ecologist from Oxford who had measured the flight pattern of bats uh, across the continent uh, that have been associated. And he found that about 50 uh, kilometers a year would these bats migrate. So he said, that relative to these outbreaks that had occurred, he could have predicted that West Africa would have an outbreak now. But my hardcore answer to that is population-based long-term studies in anything have the greatest yield. And they must be, well, if you have the resources, multidisciplinary. So you have to, everything that comes in is called malaria, or as I mentioned, typhoid, influenza. Um, uh, and you need diagnostics for that. So you set up a large scale you know, population study in a choice area where they have had or where you predict. So you think, you think smart, but these are costly and these are long-term investments. So this is what I would, and, and you, are able to look and discern these other diseases with, uh, and you do a lot of training of the local people. We, in 79, I didn't, I do have another slide there, we captured 1,600 animals, and uh, 500 of them were non-human primates. And don't forget, when you're dealing with possible hot viruses, there aren't many, you're putting them in the lab, everything has to be cleaned out of the laboratory and you're only dealing with one agent. So they were looking for hemorrhagic fever, they were looking for, we were looking for uh, pox viruses at the same time, you, you know, and, and so this, everything comes to a halt. So you have to be very, very careful. So that's how I would approach it. You, you, you know, it's a, a crapshoot. 
Sometimes you may not, but you'll find out a lot about a lot of things. But it's better than parachuting in, collecting specimens for you know a month or three weeks. And as so many of us have done, we're doing a survey and then leaving. Now I guess you know transversal studies. We come back uh, every year at different seasons, follow the same people. You can get a lot of information. But this is what I would call the Cadillac study. Okay. Other questions? Yes. It was rumored in Uganda around the late um, 1980s that there were Ebola outbreaks, or was it just a very febrile kind of thing with hemorrhage and no one could really identify it? That is a, a great question. As you know, there have been a, a number of outbreaks in Uganda. Yeah. Uh, the mega outbreak occurred there in the early 2000s. But now, some information is, is coming with uh, showing that some people, some sera, stu serologic studies <laughs> have, have been positive, and whereas previously we thought those might have been nonspecific or meaningful, not without so much meaning. There, Uganda, as you may have seen from the slide, has been the source of a lot of it. I wouldn't be surprised if there are so, so many things are called fever and chills, and you know, then they die. Or, you know, so they die, they have severe malaria or typhoid or something if they're small. If they're large outbreaks and you get the specimens, then you can diagnose. So that's why diagnostics are so important. That's why Dr. Ramoyne has set up a diagnostic laboratory right in Kinshasa to help them with so many in her team of, uh, of these diseases that are occurring. And uh, it seems that DR Congo, eight of the 24 outbreaks have occurred in DR Congo and four others in Republic of Congo, not even counting the uh, decimation of the uh, great apes that have occurred there. So this is like an area that's important, but now it's spreading elsewhere. And uh, there was someone here who's doing research in the Cameroon. I think I saw, you see, I know he looked very carefully at the phylovirus triangle. <laughs> Uh, so people are contacting me now all over the world with saying, hey, what's going on? We have bats, we have uh, hemorrhagic fevers, and uh, we think Ebola will come. But how transmissible is it? By the way, uh, some people have revisited the uh, data from 76 uh, and done some basic reproduction rates and in a December issue of Epidemics, we've published uh, an R0 of about 1.4 for the first six weeks of the epidemic, which is, you know, getting up there. And uh, the team has said that there was a, you know, about a 5% chance that we could have had 1,000 or more cases until the hospital closed and the uh, control measures occurred. So those things can be looked into as well. Yes, question. Um, I, when I saw the slide of 1976, when I saw the PPE you were wearing, and what we saw last year, how come you didn't get infected in 1976, getting so good information and you're Well, two reasons. One, uh, we were careful. You know, as, as with most. Secondly, it's not highly transmissible. It's of moderate transmission. People reproach me for saying, for saying that. Thirdly, I think many of our people who are doing the investigations did not have a lot of cuts and scratches uh, uh, or entry sites. Uh, and fourth, we came in when the epidemic was just about over. <laughs> Do that. <laughs> because I think we would like to have a lot more questions, which just means we're going to have to invite you back again. So Joel, thank you thank so you. much.